Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator Brashi back with us this Friday morning, and he'll be speaking on um, all on four concepts. He's no stranger to the dental webinar series. Dr. Brashi, thank you so much for your willingness uh, to participate in this um, series, and uh, please go ahead and um, take it away. Thank you, Uva. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon to the folks in Africa. My name is Sam Brashi. I'm a prosthodontist practicing in Portland, Oregon, which is on the West Coast. We are one state north of California. Uh, originally, I'm from Cairo, Egypt. So um, it's a pleasure for me to be speaking to my colleagues uh, back on the continent. And I want to share with you um, some of my experiences. Uh, I am not a surgeon. I work with a maxillofacial surgeon. Um, we've been working together since about 2012. He has been here since 2009, and I think he's treated over a couple of thousand patients for the all on four procedure. Um, so we're, we're starting to get the hang of it. A couple of disclosures. I'm not endorsing a particular technique. Please don't be seduced into thinking that all on four is the, the be all and end all. Um, all patients have signed a consent form. Uh, Beware anybody who claims to be an expert. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, what being an expert actually entails. And I'm going to use an evidence-based approach whenever possible. So let's talk a little bit about the demographics of edentialism in the U.S. and perhaps in the world. And difficult to, to, to make the conclusions from a so-called developed nation into developing nations. Uh, but there are trends across the world where the population is generally getting older. So in the U.S., the total adult population this year is going to be around 245 million. Baby boomers or adults aged 55 to 74, that, that demographic is increasing. Adults over the age of 75 are also increasing. And for sure, across the world, we are having more patients with chronic diseases that are living longer compared to healthy patients. They have a higher decayed, missing, or filled score of periodontitis. And this is a patient referred from the university. This is the head of her grandson here. And she's in her, I think, early 70s. She was referred to me after all the mandibular teeth were uh, extracted. She had two implants merged, and now she's got a mandibular complete dentia uh, that she's struggling with prior to connection um, of the uh, overdenture coppings and really struggling to, to make that transition from being fully dentate to edentulous. That's a, that's a very uh, significant change in a patient's quality of life. If you can transition the patient slowly where they are wearing an RPD, whether it's a class one, Kennedy class one bilateral free and saddle or something, give them some sort of opportunity to, to attempt to wear a removable prosthesis for a while before they go from being dentate to edentulous, and that's almost like training wheels. So this is something from um, some statistics here in the US. What we're looking at is the percentage or the prevalence of edentulism amongst adults uh, age 65 and over by age, gender, and race uh, in around 2011. And so the total percentage is about 19%. And every country is going to vary somewhat. What, it, what it's like in Nigeria is going to be different to Benin, to Uganda, to Ethiopia, to Egypt. It is going to depend on, on many, many uh, socioeconomic factors. Um, obviously, the healthcare system, uh, whether there's government funding and... Um, Life expectancy is also going to vary according to whether you are in an urban population or rural population, 
access to medical care, um, literacy rates. So, so there are many, many intercorrelated uh, sort of points that help patients survive longer. When we look at the patients in the 65 to 74 age year old, they're about 13 percent. And then once you get to the age of 75 and above, the rate of edentialism more or less doubles, which is significant. So one in four patients over the age of 75 is edentialist. And when we look and compare men to women, it's approximately the same, non-statistically -sign non significant. And this was surprising to me because my experience has showed me that men tend to be edentulous first or more frequently because they're often um, a little more ambivalent. When we look at the ethnic groups, non-Hispanic whites around 17%. And Hispanic white folks, it's about 15%. But then when we look at non-Hispanic black or African-Americans, that goes up significantly. And we know that edentialism is correlated with socioeconomics and um, education. This is no different to the rates of hospitalization that are being seen in the U.S. Uh, in urban cities like Detroit, where you have a, a maybe 14% black population but the rate of hospitalization of those folks is about 40%. So it, if, if you have a population in your country, a, a, an ethnic group or, or a rural population that is significantly poorer with less university education, you would expect to see a higher edentulous rate in your nation. Um, and the leading cause of edentialism is not, not a surprise to us. This is periodontitis. This is a lady who was referred from about 150 miles away. She's known she's had chronic perio for most of her life, and she got to the point where now the teeth are very loose. You can see there's a lot of calculus, and she's panicking because she's been told the only thing that she's a candidate for is a maxillary complete denture and a mandibular complete denture. And you can see she's got chronic inflammation in both sinuses. And here is the planning. We've got some shortened implants in the available bone, the premaxilla. So periodontitis is the leading cause of edentialism, affects 65 million people in the US, and I would say it affects potentially billions of people in the world. Some of these patients, by the time they get to you, they're really sort of desperate. They've hung on and they've managed as long as they have. This is a patient called Barbara. She came to see me probably five, six years ago, and she said, you know, I." I I feel a little grotesque. I can't talk. I can't eat. My teeth are hurting. And I, I'm, I've become a recluse and I'm staying home and, and I really don't have a life. And so taking out these teeth and giving the patient something, whether it's for removal, doesn't really matter. Something that is functional allows them a sense of self-esteem. They become functional. They're actually able to leave their home and eat and so on. So what we're trying to do is use something called a biopsychosocial treatment model. In other words, look at your whole patient. Biological aspects of the disease, how does it impact them? We know that rates of diabetes are higher in a periodontal patient. Um, psychological aspects of the disease, is this patient shut down? Are they covering their mouth? Are they not interacting with their children or their grandchildren? And then the social aspects of the disease. And obviously, it's a little different for us in Africa, depending on where you're at, because if people are just struggling just to make ends meet and get food and water for the day, they're not too concerned about aesthetics, they're survivor. Um, when you think of, of Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs, you've got some basic needs. But once the basic needs have, met, have been met, we, we, pe people want to thrive and they want something that gives them a sense of self-worth and self-esteem. And aesthetics is important to, to most patients. This was a seminal paper that was published in the Journal of Process 2016 with David Felton and started to look at the correlation between complete edentialism and comorbid diseases. So we have a look at some of these patients. This is an association between bacteremia, systemic inflammation. There's often an autoimmune response. Atherogenesis is, is the genesis of, of plaques or um, atherogenesis. So patients who have a um, significant amount of dental infection, they're more, more predisposed to systemic inflammation, um, and that can manifest as infective endocarditis. 
that could be a stroke. Many, many different ways where you have an oral systemic connection that is negative for a patient. And sleep apnea is something that we are dealing with in the States on a significant basis. So obstructive sleep apnea, I know there was a webinar a couple of weeks ago and we talked about it, or, or one of the, the doctors from Michigan talked about it. The incidence of sleep apnea, male to female is two to one ratio. It is related to age. It is definitely related to BMI. And if a patient has more than a 17 and a half inch neck, I don't know what that is in centimeters, they are more likely to have sleep apnea. So, you know, when you become a dentalist, you're actually more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea because of the collapse um, in vertical dimension and the tongue resumes a more retrograssal position and perhaps also having dentures is also going to drive the tongue back and uh, close down the airway. Diabetes is going to be the seventh leading cause of death in the world by the year 2030. And we know that we have lots of patients with chronic perio and smoking and patients with less than 19 teeth with a difficulty for eating at a greater risk for cardiovascular disease than patients with 20 teeth. So we know that 20 teeth seems to be the magic number and that's not 16 teeth in one arch and four in the other. 10 against 10, shortened dental arch concept, second premolar to second premolar. Most patients can function without molars but they need to have 10 pairs of teeth opposing. In male patients and um, diabetic patients, so male patients are non-insulin dependent diabetes, there's a 30% increased risk for perio, and they're 22% more likely to be partially edentulous than non-diabetic patients. So diabetes is correlated with partial edentulism, which can then tie into periodontal disease, it can also tie into need for use of an RPD. And we know that using a partial denture in a, in, a, in a mouth such as this is actually going to accelerate the rate of tooth loss. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Diabetes mellitus increases with age. Tooth loss increases the percentage of diabetes mellitus. And diabetes diabetic patients more likely to use partials than non-diabetic patients. This is a youngish woman. She's been edentulous or partially edentulous in the, in the mandible for many, many years. You can see how thin the ridge was and she presented with a lower partial denture, recession, mucogingival defects. And the real question is, do you try and graft this and build it up and place two implants here and two implants there, perhaps extracting the molar? Or are you going to make the partial denture and have the patient muddle along with that? And it's a patient-specific thing. She couldn't tolerate the partial. You can also see the major connector is not really well um, uh, aligned with the teeth or the teeth have moved. The prevalence of edentialism, you see 28% incidence of edentialism in a diabetic cohort and 14% in a non-diabetic patient. This patient looks like he's an excellent candidate for dentures, except for the following. He has Parkinson's disease. He has a tardive dyskinesia and his head kind of bobbles and his jaw moves around. He also takes some medication, uh, which is giving him a significant amount of dry mouth. So if you have a dry mouth, it's going to be difficult to tolerate complete dentures. And that's something that seems to be missed a lot lately. I, I, I don't understand why. And this is what a denture looks like when a patient doesn't remove it for years and years. 10% of deaths from pneumonia in nursing homes with patients wearing a complete denture may have been prevented with better oral hygiene. There's a correlation between aspiration pneumonia and infection and perhaps death and lack of removing a removable prosthesis. Acrylic resin acts as a reservoir for bacteria and fungi. Those, those bacteria can then be deposited down inside a patient's lungs and can create a problem, especially if you have an immunocompromised patient. And when we look at these CT scans of a normal patient compared to an Alzheimer's patient, there was a study in Wisconsin um, where they looked at, at one physician who had been following a group of nurses for many, many years. They actually did post-mortem um, analysis on these patients 
and they found that a low number of teeth is correlated with a high incidence of dementia. And that's not a that's not a cause and effect. It's not to say if you are partially edentulous, you will develop some sort of cognitive decline, but there seems to be an association between number of missing teeth and uh, something like Alzheimer's or dementia. So, th- and it makes sense because of the nutritional component that we need to keep our brains active. If somebody is partially edentulous or edentulous, there are certain food groups that they cannot take part in. And this is a somewhat typical patient that we see. She's 77. She weighs 153 pounds. She's allergic to the following medications, and she has these things. Dry mouth, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, hypercholesterol, hypertension, stage 3 kidney disease, arthropathy, arthritis, tinnitus, constipation, back and neck pain, headaches, lymphadenopathy, anxiety and depression, insomnia, GERD, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, alcohol use, irritable bowel syndrome, and a history of cancer. She takes all these medications. Very challenging patient to, to, to handle. She also has obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so when I'm trying in the teeth and she's able to see uh, the abutment on number three because the tissues receded, she's telling me that's unacceptable and the acrylic needs to cover that. So you need to be able to manage the patients medically and psychologically. Let's talk a little bit about multimorbidity and polypharmacy. Polypharmacy really means when a patient takes multiple medications, and some of those may be over-the-counter medications, which are popular in, in other cultures, whether it's China or Egypt. Or Herbal remedies are still popular, and dietary supplements. And some of these things affect a significant amount of, a, of patients, especially when it comes to bleeding. So ginger, ginseng, ginkgo, those things can make a patient more predisposed to bleeding. Multimorbidity is the coexistence of two plus chronic health conditions, and those two conditions superimposed with the medications can lead to other complications, such as adverse drug events, increased rates of emergency room visits, Patients are less able to cope, both physiologically and psychologically. They have less gas in the tank. So, you know, so if you have a 90-year-old patient who's taking six medications, living by his or herself, that's a difficult patient to, to explain and consent as you're doing a complicated procedure. You will often need a family member. Patients have a poor quality of life. They may have some psychological issues and a higher uh, increased, sorry, increased mortality rate and morbidity. And often they have fragmented medical advice where one physician is not communicating with the other. And many times there's less patient compliance. We had a patient who's from India who, who doubled up on his Coumadin dose after surgery, the day after surgery, and of course he had bleeding. So those chronic conditions that the patients have leads to an increased medication list, which means that you can have more complex pharmacological uh, interactions leading potentially to adverse drug events. Patients then start to decline, and sometimes it's based upon the medications that we're giving them. In the US, unfortunately, there's a a tendency tendency to prescribe a lot of pain medications for years and years, and patients become addicted versus trying to figure out what is the cause of the pain. More chronic conditions, and you get this feedback loop, what I call a prescribing cascade, where just round and round we go, and nobody's really bothered to sit down and figure out what's going on with this patient and how can I give them less medication and and, and have them function well versus 20 different pills every morning. Some of these patients late in life are faced with difficult decisions. This is Charlie. She's a former patient of mine in my private practice. And Charlie was treated by my predecessor. He did a lot of crown and bridge. She has significant Sjogren syndrome, dry mouth, itchy eyes, arthritis, and her saliva gland function is shutting down. She doesn't really have a high um, sugar intake, but she's getting a high caries rate. And we've tried fluoride trays and so on, and and she's getting really frustrated because look at all these composites that were done in in a clinic called Kaiser Permanente. And she said, you know, I just can't get ahead of it. And if these margins are all subgingival and she's developing subgingival caries, and she has excellent oral hygiene, perhaps routine dentistry has failed her. 
And what do I mean by a white flag? If the patient gets to the point where they've given up, really doing more of the same doesn't do much for them. It may do something for you in the sense that, well, I'm saving teeth and I'm going to go ahead and crown 6 through 11 and 20 through 27. What's, what's that look like two years from now? We know there are emotional effects of tooth loss, both in partially edentulous and fully edentulous patients. They become socially inhibited. They have low self-esteem. They enjoy eating less. They perhaps look older. And these effect, effects are magnified with ill-fitting dentures. This is a patient from Idaho. She had an iliac crest bone graft in the maxilla that failed. She's got four implants in the mandible that are actually placed, five implants actually, actually placed. She came to see me. She said, I, 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 I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, my dentures don't fit. Uh, and I, I don't think I can do another bone graft. I'm still smoking and so on. And all I did for her was make her a, a good maxillary complete denture and a, and a mandibular fix hybrid. And you can see her whole demeanor and everything has changed. Full edentialism meets the World Health Organization criteria for physical impairment, dis disability, and being handicapped. And so with some of these patients, we, there's an erosive component, uh, erosion and attrition. This patient is not bulimic or anorexic. She came to see me in the university about 15 years ago. And my treatment planning back then was potentially crown and bridge and endo and cast posts and cores on, on all of these teeth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Either an implant or a three-unit bridge. But this, this could be a crown and bridge case. The question is, after you've done the endo on all these teeth and you've had to build up with a cast post and core on the lingual, what is the ridiculous tooth content and what's the prognosis for those teeth? She elected not to do that. She said, you know, I, I, I have friends who have had that and the, the teeth break and so on. And here she is with, with us doing a try and this is approximately 2013. Mandible, slightly better condition, but you can see extreme wear. This tooth is non-restorable. That's non-restorable. That's non-restorable. These guys are, she would still need two mandibular implants in the first molar position and a crown and bridge. In this instance, she elected to extract the teeth. And I realize that some of you might say, well, this is over treatment. But at this point, you, you really kind of have to listen to what the patient is, is looking for and compare the cost. And I'm not talking about the monetary cost. I am talking about doing traditional dentistry, straightening these teeth out without ortho, doing crown and bridge, and then in the future, as the teeth fail, placing implants slightly ad hoc uh, as teeth fail. So patients expect physical and mental well-being, this is her before and her after, with outward physical and emotional happiness. And some patients are really concerned about function. Some patients are concerned about aesthetics. An oral health impact profile is a way of measuring the patient-based measures of different aspects of treatment. It's one thing for me to think that treatment was successful, but I need an objective way of understanding what that means to a patient. So there's a form that you can download. It has 14 criteria that, that a patient fills out at the beginning of treatment, and they can fill it out at the end of treatment, and you can compare and see really what the patient felt about improvement or not based upon what you did for them. And it's a three-dimensional thing. So they're looking at psychosocial impact, pain and discomfort, and a functional limitation. So OHIP1 is speaking, sense of taste, painful aching, uncomfortable eating, unsatisfactory diet, interruption of meals, and so on and so forth. So it gives them a way of quantifying it. And it allows them to measure their discomfort, their dysfunction, and the disability due to their oral conditions. And you get a nice comparison before and after, hopefully with an improvement um, and, and a patient doing better at the end of treatment. And this is a study comparing dentate versus edentulous patients in South Australia, age 60 and above. And interestingly, dentate patients, their functional limitation was 7.91. Standard deviation of 5.15. In edentulous patients, the mean was higher, standard deviation was higher, and the p-value is 0.04. So that is significant. And then when we have a look at physical disability, there's a significance. In other words, edentulous patients 
do have a sense of physical disability that's worse than dentate patients, and their functional limitation is also significantly different. Interestingly, the physical pain, the psychological discomfort, um, the psychological disability, the social disability, and this is just in a group of folks who, who were indigenous Australians or Aborigines. So this is going to vary according to culture. It's also going to vary according to demographics and where you are in the world. So let's look at this tip, somewhat typical patient. This fellow used to work in the airport in Portland. He's a singer. Um, he's actually a Frank Sinatra impersonator. And this is the gentleman that I was talking about earlier. His name is John, who's lost all of his teeth. He's been fighting Parkinson's for a long time. He's edentulous, and he's had dentures fabricated for him that he cannot tolerate. Here is the planning that we're looking at. Obviously, good ridge form. We don't see a significant amount of undercuts or tori and what have you. But medically, he's complex. He has diabetes, stage 3 kidney disease, polyneuropathy, hypertension. And the, the end result of all of this is significant dry mouth. And because of the tardive dyskinesia, he cannot manage his dentures. Literally, his head shakes and bobs. So I'm going ahead. I'm doing a wax try -in. I'm figuring out my vertical dimension. I'm duplicating my prostheses as a surgical guide. These are the windows that will show my surgeon where the bone reduction needs to be. And this is the provisional set of teeth on the day of surgery. Healing. You can see the tissues are a little bit inflamed. And one of the, the concerns we had with this patient, because of his manual dexterity and the tremors, we wanted to make sure that he could get in at least with a water pick. He's unable to get in there with a the super floss. There's the provisional. You can see the arch shape is not, not ideal. Healing and the tissues look a little bit better. Obviously, some inflammation around this abutment. There's the final zirconia prosthesis in the mandible. Lots of keratinized mucosa. Healing the, the zirconia prosthesis. Nice result, but it allows the patient to function. And this was kind. We treated this patient pro bono. Strauman allowed me to, the prosthesis for free, and then we were able to get a grant from the Osseo Integration Foundation. I'm not, I'm not really showing you that case to, to explain what all on four technique is. I'm just trying to explain for some patients that complete dentures are contraindicated. And so when you look at this quote, an edentulous patient is an amputee to whom we should pay total respect and rehabilitation and patients. Many times we're dealing with older patients and the elderly vary. They're not just older folks, they're heterogeneous. Some of them have psychological problems, some have physiological problems, some have both. And the number and severity of these diseases is significant. This man is 94, she's in her eighties. He had 12 implants placed overseas that we had to remove. He came to see me for five years before I treated him pro bono. She got a mandibular uh, prosthesis and a maxillary complete denture. Each one of them is unique and they bring different problems. The challenges are polypharmacy, multimorbidity, their logistics and mobility, their socioeconomic limitations, but this is really the priority for me. Their physical and mental reserves. What would you do if these folks are your parents or your grandparents? Because if you would treat them the same if they were your family, then I think that treatment is valid. And this is a gentleman that I just figured, you know what, an upper denture and a lower hybrid would suffice. He kept breaking it right here. His bite force was so strong, he kept breaking this cantilever. So I ended up doing three bicuspids over here. I just figured with a maxillary complete denture, his occlusal forces weren't that strong. He's about 97 now. And so when we look at medical clearances, which is very important, is the patient a good candidate for surgery? What's their medical history? What type of clearance do you need? What is their disposition psychologically? There's a, there's a, uh, a classification of prosthodontics by a fellow called Dr. House, probably from about a century ago, where we classify patients as philosophical, exacting, hysterical, or indifferent. What is the quantitative and qualitative evaluation of the bone? And is the patient in a, in a partially edentulous state? That, are they suffering with terminal dentition or are they edentulous? This is Mary. She comes to see me. She's got some occlusal disharmony. 
she's got obviously some splaying and drifting and so on. She said to me, I want to go back to looking how I looked like when I was younger. This is her as a young woman. So these are complex things. You need to be able to not only look at the patient's physical status, their mental status, but it, it also becomes complex when you have this type of thing and we're attempting to save teeth. So the medical clearance has to be pretty thorough. And this is an example of the medical clearance that we, we request. What is the patient's cardiac risk? And this is sent to their primary care physician. Does this patient have a history of heart attack or stroke? Can we use local anesthesia with that much epi roughly every 30 minutes? What is the other relevant medical history that perhaps the patients haven't disclosed? Are there any medical conditions that we ought to be aware of? Is the patient medically stable to go undergo the procedure as an outpatient? This patient is scheduled to be monitored using uh, EKG, lead to rhythm strip, et cetera, during IV sedation. And we may be using Versed, fentanyl, propofol, ketamine, decadron, toradol, acetaminophen, and zofran. Now, my partner is an MD, so I, I really don't get involved in this portion of their care. And we also have a nurse anesthetist who comes in. So if you're doing IV sedation and you're doing the surgery yourself, you've got to have a really good understanding of, of the patient, their level of sedation, their ability to respond, their oxygen saturation, their heart function, um, their blood pressure. And the challenges are some of these patients are extremely anxious and they come in prior to surgery and they're already at, say, 145 or 150 over 100. And this is one of those patients. So his optimized blood pressure prior to surgery was 150 over 100. He has diabetes. He has sleep apnea. He smokes, he drinks, and he's a clencher. Is this patient a high risk for implant failure? Absolutely. So you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Let's talk a little bit about the all on four concept and planning bone reduction and, and why is that important for us? And I realize you're going to have more presentations uh, coming up on the all on four. Um, I, I'm going to get into a little bit of detail now. So it's very important if the patient is dentate that you create enough prosthetic space for the prosthesis to have adequate bulk and for the incisal edges to be in the right position of the teeth and the implants to have adequate bone. So it really depends on the patient's smile line and what you're trying to achieve. And so you are looking at the CT scan and you're planning for implant position approximately 15 millimeters apical to the proposed occlusal plane for the incisal edge position. And so this is a, a partially dentalous patient, and this is the CT scan, and, and I'm planning ahead of time. Now, my surgeon also does his own planning, but I'm trying to understand how much space do I need from the head of the implant here to the head of the implant there. And it's approximately 33, 34 millimeters if this is the vertical dimension that we're gonna be working at, right? Because we need 15 millimeters here, 15 millimeters there, and then we need freeway space. And so you got to, if you're using acrylic and titanium, you approximately need four millimeters for the, for the abutment to come through the mucosa and to allow for hygiene. And you can see this particular design is is very hygienic and the patient can get in and clean easily. Five millimeters up to the titanium bar and more or six millimeters for the acrylic. And that's a somewhat generic um, uh, numbers. With zirconia, you may need less, but it all really depends on what is your proposed occlusal scheme look like, opposing teeth natural and so on. So you need to look at the patient's lip, their smile line. How much space do you need? What's the emergence profile? And you, you sort of cook all these things and you figure out, do I need to reduce bone or not? Because if you have a patient with significant atrophy in the mandible and he or she has been a dentalist for years, you're not doing any bone reduction. In fact, you're, you're trying to find bone. So really when you have a dentate patient, you're doing a pre-surgical list how much bone is available and that's based on the ct scan 
how much can be removed to allow me to place an 8, 10, 11 millimeter implant? What are my implant dimensions going to be? I think longer is better if, if, if it doesn't get in the way of your prosthesis, within limits, of course. What is the transition line? What is the junction between the artificial gingiva and the natural gingiva? And then your prosthetic planning is going to be based upon what's the patient's smile line like? So for these cases, photography is important. And if nothing else, take a picture of the patient with the regular smile line and, and allow your technician to see that. It's very, very important. What is the height of the smile line? What is the patient's lip length? And that can be somewhat difficult to measure. Is it long, short, or average? What's the lip support like from an AP position? Is it adequate or deficient? What is the proposed incisal edge position? And really, when we're planning these cases, you've got to have a good understanding of removable prosthetics because eight and nine are going to dictate more or less everything else, or at the two maxillary central incisors. We know that our mandibular occlusal plane is roughly halfway or two-thirds up the retromolar pad, so we can establish our mandibular occlusal plane. But the real question is with this patient is what is her proposed smile line? What is her vertical dimension of occlusion, vertical dimension rest, and where is her freeway space? Is she a class one, two, or three? And what are you going to finish up with? And what is the closest speaking space? When she says 66, does she sound natural and the teeth don't touch? Or when she says 66, she sounds like this because everything's too tall. So phonetics is important. So here is planning the case. And this looks aggressive because when you look from the incisal edge position, to the head of the implant, we're looking at 20 millimeters. But you're not reducing 20 millimeters of bone because there's a tooth that's super erupted and it, there's been some extrusion. And you need three, four millimeters of apical bone to, al to, to, to give you primary stability. So here she is in her provisional. You can see there's a little bit of a cant that she holds her head slightly. If you don't reduce the bone adequately, this is a different patient, you're left with this type of emergence. Inadequate space, fracture, you can see there's hardly any room for the titanium. This is a prosthesis that was made in Las Vegas. And when you remove the mandibular prosthesis and you turn it upside down, the contour is also very poor in terms of hygiene. Here's the maxillary prosthesis cameo surface. So bone reduction not only allows you aesthetic success, but it allows the right prosthesis contour for the patient to maintain and clean. The new prosthesis that I've remade in maxilla, well, what we call a Montreal design, where I've opened up the vertical and I've tried to use a metal finish line to give me a little bit more space and, and a more ideal contour. Let's look at a different patient. Same checklist. How much bone does he have? How much do I need to take away? What implant dimensions am I going to be left with? What's the transition line like? And when we look at his smile line, he has a high smile line, potentially vertical maxillary excess, low upper lip. Proposed in size alleged position is going to be quite a bit more apical. His vertical dimension, I think, is perhaps open. We need to close it down. He's a class two. I want to make him a class one if possible. And... I'm not doing a hybrid prosthesis for him in the maxilla. I'm doing a maxillary complete denture, which still needs significant bone reduction, and a mandibular um, fixed hybrid. And when we have a look at his occlusal relationship, you can see he's got significant caries. There he is close up. But look at the amount of alveolar hyperplasia there's been. This is a patient who was traumatized as a child because he had some teeth taken out before he was numb. Now have a look at what's happened here. If you don't reduce the bone, it doesn't matter what prosthesis you make, it's going to fail. Planning, we ended up restoring him with a maxillary um, <clears throat> cobalt chrome uh, denture. And here he is in the mandible years later. This is about eight years after treatment, after removing the bridge. You can see he's got a little bit of inflammation here, but not terrible pretty significant difference before and after. So bone reduction is significant in terms of success on many, many different levels.
If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. I know there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a reluctance to reduce bone because we think that bone is sacrosanct. And I used to feel that way. And seven, eight years ago, I, before I joined Clear Choice, I had lots and lots of hybrids where there was inadequate bone reduction done. And the patients keep coming back over and over and over again with fractured acrylic. So bone reduction, it's, 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 it's important and indicated. And this sounds like a strange thing to say when it's indicated. So let's look at a more straightforward case and digital planning of these cases. Class one patient, partially dentate maxilla, partially dentate mandible, a little bit of recession. It's had a tooth taken out here recently. We're saving the teeth in the maxilla, in the mandible, not so much. In the mandible, to save these teeth, you would need to extract both lateral incisors, do implants in the first molar and the bicuspid. So he would end up with two implants here, two implants there, and two implants here. And in his instance, I don't think it's indicated. He's a former smoker. Obviously, this tooth needs to come out. Um, he's attempted to wear a partial denture. It wasn't very successful. So what's the biomechanical rationale for tilting implants and the relevance of anterior-posterior spread? All we're trying to do is shorten our cantilever. We want our anterior implants to be anterior, and we want our distal implants to be as far back as we can get them. And we'll talk a little bit about implants distal to the foramen, perhaps on a different session. But typically, it's four implants between the mental foramina, and what you're trying to do is decrease that distal cantilever. Here is the planning. Again, we're taking into account that we're going to need at least 15 millimeters. There's the uh, image that's been scanned. We're trying to determine where is our anterior and posterior plane of occlusion. We know that our mandibular posterior teeth need to bisect the ridge. There's the digital setup, which is the equivalent of doing a wax up. These are the images that are sent to me. Ideal arrangement, class one, overjet and overbite, vertical and horizontal determinants. There is my surgical guide. Here is my uh, monolithic uh, milled acrylic prosthesis, and we'll talk about that in a moment. There is my printed um, bite registration. After surgery, we are taking an abutment level impression. So here is the fixture. Here is a 30 degree multi unit abutment. Here is an impression coping. Anteriorly fixture, straight abutment, and then impression coping. And I want to verify radiographically that everything seats. So we've taken an abutment level impression, and then I've picked up two copings intraorally. So this is polymethyl methacrylate that's been injected. And now we've generated a model, and now we're doing this in the lab. So we're cutting down, this molar becomes a bicuspid. We're adding acrylic on the lingual and on the buckle, we're adding some composite. Let's talk a little bit about the soft tissue melage and what's happening here. So you can see the suture lines and what we're doing in order to shape the tissues appropriately, we are actually taking this soft tissue and taking a straight burr on a straight handpiece, just an acrylic burr and smoothing down. So you can see you've removed some of these undulations. And if you look on the left, this is before, and this is what it looks like on the right, to allow the prosthesis to have a natural shape or a flat undersurface to minimize the soft tissue healing with a convexity or a concavity on the undersurface. Here is the prosthesis. Now we're starting to apply composite. If you wanna go that way and you're layering your composite and that's a provisional prosthesis. The problem with this provisional prosthesis is it looks too good. As my dad used to say, never make a good provisional. And there are the copings uh, at the end when we've delivered the prosthesis. Now the patient hasn't, he's been back for a three month appointment and I'm trying to convince him to come back and get his final. He hasn't paid for his final. He's only paid for the provisional. He said, I think I'm okay with this one. So you gotta be careful. We evolve. With time, not every case is a success. This is a pyramid outside of Cairo. It's about 40 kilometers outside. It's called the Bent Pyramid. And this is when they were developing and trying to, 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 to 
evolve, started off making pyramids of steps. And then eventually they were able to get to the Great Pyramid of Giza. But this is somewhere along the path. They were building this. They realized the foundation wasn't solid enough and they had to change the angles. So is there a big benefit to angling implants versus straight implants? I'm going to go out on a limb and say not necessarily. This is the same patient. Actually placed implants, plenty of bone, good AP spread. In the maxilla, to place an axial implant, you would have gone into the sinus. You could actually place another two implants in the maxilla and tilt. So really what you're trying to do is establish a good number of implants. And there's research to say that four is enough. Perhaps more than four doesn't give you any benefit. And so what are the pros and cons of this versus that? And, and that's something that, that's going to be decided by you. You do need to work as a team. You can't do this all yourself. This is a prosthodontist doing surgery, and this is the mess at his desk. Um, what's the impact of your team's experience? There are critical steps that you cannot miss. So verification jigs are very important. If you're flasking and processing an acrylic, that has to be done very precisely because contamination can lead to failure. There are biological factors that the patient brings that can lead to failure. This is a patient 10 years after surgery. You can see we've left his impacted wisdom teeth and he's a heavy smoker. He has pus coming out from this. This has now failed. So what role do the patient factors, the biological and psychological, bring into the, the, the success or failure, we'll call it a map of the prosthesis. Obviously, picking the wrong patient for the wrong procedure can be disastrous. This is a patient who's been on bisphosphonates for six years. She didn't go on a drug holiday. They placed implants in the mandible. This case was done in St. Louis and she's had a fracture of the mandible. So what role do provider factors play into success or failure? Significant. And of course, picking the right prosthesis. So this is a removable prosthesis that was made for a patient. Even though she has five implants, you can see it's a cast bar that's fractured. And when I remove it, it's ill-fitting this calculus at the junction between the prosthesis and the abutment, and she has fractured prosthetic screws. So the lab has huge input into success or failure. <laughs> Adequate space is critical. You need to understand the amount of space you will have at the end of the case before you do the case. If you get nothing else from today's presentation, this is the slide that you need to, to, to kind of get your head around. I need to know how much space do I have from the incisal edge to here based upon what I'm planning on doing and do I need to create more space or do I have enough for what I'm doing? If you have enough, great. If you don't, you gotta do something different. There are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. Typical patient, upper and lower denture. He plays the trumpet. He's had two five millimeter implants placed in the premaxilla, which is kind of strange. And he does not struggle with his mandibular denture. What he's struggling with is his maxillary denture when he's coming to, to, to sort of hold the, the instrument to his mouth and and purses lips to make that sound. So he wants a fixed prosthesis. So here is planning the case. Number four, you can see. Upper right lateral. Upper left lateral between the two existing implants, which we're going to remove. And upper distal most implant anterior to the sinus. So the implants have been removed. We've reduced the bone. You can see the size of the osteotomy of where they were was huge. And we're planning on placing our implant right here. Bone reduction and checking with your surgical guide that you have enough. Here is the osteotomy on the upper right. Checking the depth to make sure you're not into the nasal cavity. Implant placement. These are neodent implants. And again, back to reducing the bone to making sure that we have enough space. Here is the implant on the upper left anterior to the sinus, tilting that implant, making sure you have adequate torque. And there is, with the multi-unit abutments, 30 degree, straight, straight, 30 degree, the emergence profile. And I checked that with my surgical guide, which has a trough. 
My surgeon is always taking a radiograph once he's finished to make sure the abutments are seated all the way down. Sometimes if you don't profile the bone, that won't seat. And then here is the radiograph with my provisional prosthesis. And this is an easy transition for a patient who was completely edentulous with a full maxillary complete dentition because the footprint of this in the palate is not very big. And here he is on the day of surgery. So this is just to demonstrate that sometimes you have to deal with, with tricky situations. And this type of cantilever I think is acceptable, around 10, 12 millimeters. So is the evidence robust for what I've been proposing? And this was a review that came out in 2018 with Tara Agalu, Tom Taylor, and Polito. And they looked at the number of implants placed for complete arch prosthesis. Is there a difference between four, five, six, or more better? And what they did is they looked at 1,533, removed duplicate records and so on, and they got down to 93 studies in a review and a meta-analysis. And the conclusion was fewer than five implants per arch when compared to five or more implants to support a fixed prosthesis of the completely edentulous maxillo mandible present similar survival rates with no statistically significant difference at the 5% level on a confidence interval of 95%. So I would, I would say to you that there is now robust research to say that four is enough. Now, sometimes we'll do five, sometimes we'll do six. It really depends on the situation. And failures happen. So this is a patient, partially edentulous, about to retire from the Army Corps of Engineer, knows that he doesn't want a mandibular denture. We did a lower all on four and upper denture. He hated it. Said, I want something fixed on the top. He came back and to increase our AP spread, we did not use an angled abutment. We used a straight abutment here to decrease the cantilever. This implant was symptomatic. I more or less ignored it, trying to give it more time to integrate. I got as far as my titanium bar still symptomatic. At this point, we stopped. We removed that implant. I processed his prosthesis with three implants. So I cut the bar, delivered it. So basically, this implant's been removed and grafted. And we're coming back and placing an implant on the upper right and upper right. So he's going from four implants to five. So implants have been submerged. He's a smoker. He's still wearing the upper prosthesis as a provisional. There are no teeth over here. Letting everything heal, that's before. Here it is after. And now the prosthesis have been processed. And we think this happened is because he's doing most of his chewing on the right side. That's just his preference. So let's look at the research and see why we have uh, failure rates and, and what, what, what are the things that can, can contribute to failure with 10 to 18 years of follow-up. So a retrospective study, 471 patients, 1,884 implants. I think that's robust. 10 to 18 year follow-up. I like that. The primary outcome measure is prosthetic survival and implant success. And the results, 6% of patients were deceased and they lost 32% of patients to follow-up. That means that they, they were able to follow up close to 60% of the patients, which I think is significantly high considering the number of years. Prosthetic survival rate was 98.8%. Implant survival rate is 93%. Implant success depends on how you define success versus survival is about 92%. A previous biological complication was associated with implant failure, 4.4x. Biological complications occurred at about 12% at the implant level. This study was in Portugal. Smoking and a history of previous implant failure and biological complications associated with marginal bone loss, more than three millimeters. And incidence of mechanical complications at 37% in male patients. So you'll see more mechanical complications in men versus women. And the prosthesis material is associated with failure. All acrylic fails more than metal acrylic, which fails more than porcelain fused to metal. And when they had a look at healthy patients versus compromised patients, you can see over 10 years, cumulative survival rate is 94% with a compromised patient versus a healthy patient, 98%. 
And then when we have a look at around 150 months, it goes down. So systemic conditions correlate or, or systemic complications can correlate with implant failure. This is bone loss at 10 to 15 years. And there's a 78% increase in odds of a mechanical complication in male versus female. When they had a look at the, the broke down the, the particular fractures, prosthesis fracture was 18%. Abutment fracture was 0.2%. Abutment screw loosening is 16%. That seems high compared to what we run into. Prosthetic screw fracture is low. Prosthetic, prosthetic screw loosening is also low. Prosthesis fracture, when it's all acrylic, is high. I agree with that. Let's forget about ceramic crown. Um, cylinder fracture, that can happen, especially on the distal. Abutment screw loosening, again, that was high. So fairly comparable results to what we run into. So it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. And then Uvo, I'm open for questions. Hi guys, uh, do we have any, any questions? If you have any questions, please type it in, in, the, in the chat uh, area called Q&A. And um, Dr. Abrashi will gladly take it. If you have any questions, please. Dr. Gadi, are you there? Uh, Dr. Gadi, I, 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 can you hear me? If you have any questions, please let me know. Just lift your, raise your hand and I would... Um, give you access, access to speak and... Um, Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, Gary, Hello. please go ahead. Yes, uh, Dr. El-Grashi, excellent, excellent presentation. Good morning, uh, Gary. Good morning, good morning. I'm actually on my drive to work. I, I plugged this in uh, just to listen as I'm uh, heading, heading to Carlsbad. I'm, 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 happy, I'm, I'm happy it didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> oh, no, 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 this was like a a morning jolt of coffee, that, that was excellent. You touched on right. everything that most people never think about. Uh, people look at the dollar signs, oh, I can make 25 or 30,000 in no, March. No. Not, not considering uh, psychological uh, conditions of the patients. I love how you went over the house classification. Most people don't know anything about hysterical or, or any of those classifications. Um, that, and that's a that's a major component, like you said, the lady who showed a little metal and thought that was unacceptable. So sadly, you, for as, as you and I have figured out that this these types of the more complex the procedure, the more you attract that group of patients. Oh yes, oh yes, and and uh, so thank you. And then I mean, you really went into the medical of uh, the medical situations that people have to consider, as well as the psychological situations. Because it's not just the the uh, the mechanical, the aesthetics. It's everything. I mean, you're changing people's lives, and you see it, and you see it. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And and also, lastly, I wanted to say uh, thanks for going over that that study that showed the robust um, nature of uh, uh, plus or minus five implants per arch. You know, people make the argument all all the time, all on four and none on three. But the, 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 the real deal is the, the, is the distribution of the implants. It's not, to me, the number, it's the distribution. And, and based, on, based on risk factors, sometimes you want to over-engineer, like you say, the patient with multi, multiple systemic issues. You know you, you know, you may have a higher incidence of failure, so now you over-engineer because of that, not because of your uh, anecdotal feelings about something, so... Excellent. That's all I have to say. Thank well, you, Gary. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to just ask uh, Dr. Do, Dr. Professor Umesi, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I know you're a professor at the, in one of the dentists. Yes, go ahead. Do you have any comments? 
Uh, no, no, go right ahead. Go ahead. Give him that day very well. Well, we're well, looking forward to um, um, and, and having uh, Dr. Brashi. I mean, this is a little uh, forward on my end, but I'm thinking at some point we're going to have um, a team from the U.S. go to Nigeria and just um, do some teaching and actual, uh, 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 you know, restoration of some patients. What do you think? You think it's something that can be arranged? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. Obviously, with the whole COVID thing, nobody's going to be traveling anytime soon. I, know, I, know, I, know. Um, I mean, you know, the thing, the thing about this procedure, it's so complex. You've got to have surgeons who are competent. You've got to pick the right patients, anesthesia, prostate. There's a lot of moving parts, Uvo, as you know. Um, and so I think before you get into live patient treatment, if you could at least do some typodont stuff, it, 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 it is really pretty complex. Uh, but should should life ever settle down and, and we can travel and all of that? Sure. I mean, people need it. You know, I, 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 I thought at this point, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, can we organize, what can we do in terms of, because uh, there are so many universities here present, so we're talking about um, 22 countries listening on this, and I, I think it's a huge opportunity here um, to, get to, to get, you know, uh, these experts to, you know, contribute. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just a simple thing like doing um, a type of um, so exercise where you would be removing teeth, reducing bone, placing two mandibular implants, just two, in the lower cuspid position, suturing, putting an overdenture attachment on, and a little reline. Inside. I mean, th th this is complex treatment, and I think if you can if you can build people up so that they build up their confidence versus uh, just going with with the most difficult part of it, so. There are definitely things that can be done along the way to help people feel le less nervous and, and more um, uh, sort of better trained. Yes, yes. Anyway, I, I will speak with you off camera. I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm really thinking, I'm thinking of what to, you know, I, I've, I've started um, putting together a lab with virtual components, stuff that we can do. Just do and creating a surgical guide. That's my first lab exercise. Uh, we'll talk about it. Um, anyway, okay. uh, tomorrow this weekend we have uh, we have <laughs> four lectures. Uh, it, it's it's uh, you know Dr. Gadia Peabody who was just earlier on will be on Sunday. Uh, Dr. Adriana uh, Sempron Clavier, uh, she's going to be tomorrow. Uh, she's going to be speaking on updates on curiology and she's going to be talking about advanced standing program for dentists who want to practice in the United States. She's uh, head of a program here at the UIC, University of Illinois at Chicago. She'll be talking about a program, talking about some updates on curiology. You don't want to miss that. And, uh, 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 and a maxillofacial prosthodontist, Dr. Eugenio Aquino, is going to be talking about. Uh, uh, the, the accuracy of 3D guides. And uh, Dr. Kendi Babalala, she's going to be speaking. She's, uh, uh, she's, an, she's a radiologist, maxillofacial radiologist. She's going to be speaking about um, uh, radiology for oral implantology. I mean, these lectures are going to help your career one way or the other. So looking for Dr. 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 I think Dr. Semprom. Dr. Semprom, are you there? Dr. Semprom, are you, are, are you there? I don't know if you're at work, but anyway, I, I did see you online. I can see you there, but uh, I don't know if you're able to speak. But uh, looking forward to having you tomorrow. Uh, please invite folks. I uh, welcome, want to welcome back those from Ethiopia. There's been some problem in Ethiopia where the internet was uh, um, down in, in the entire country uh, for the past couple of weeks. We got used to some unrest there, but things are back now. So we have a lot of... Uh, Ethiopians uh, attendees back on. So looking forward to see you guys tomorrow. This video, hopefully, I'm going to upload it on YouTube. It's very good. You want to go back and um, hopefully I'm going to speak and try and gather how we can do some lab exercises. Uh, the next one we need to do, organize, you know, at some point, the next phase will be some, we, we have to, whether COVID keeps us in different continents, we're going to use technology and find a way of, you know, just doing some practicals uh, with these sessions. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, 
that happening. Thank you, Dr. Ebrashi. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your your my pleasure for this course. Thank you, and uh, have a wonderful day and wonderful weekend. Same to you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 